right, so we have new platforms that provide secure connectivity to new and emerging markets. And the first one up is a product that we're releasing this month. Um, it's a rugged cellular router that's also a Wi-Fi access point, uh, BGNN. This device has a whole bunch of antennas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a murder kill uh, router <laughs> hybrid environmental device. It, so if you want you can take a look at it, pass it around. It's got a four port uh, switch, four serial ports, um, robust Wi-Fi security as well as uh, the cellular backhaul. So this product, amongst requests from customers, um, <laughs> don't be over there guys. <laughs> This product has, uh, has an opportunity in the transportation industry. So outside of traditional IT management, uh, this device can find itself in a uh, school bus, say with an IP camera, and you can monitor both GPS location, you can stream back vehicle health, you can see if the kids are fighting, throwing food or attacking the bus driver with an IP camera, uh, and keeping a location on the device as well. <laughs> 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 Plus, you have the digital I.O., so you can tell for any type of physical uh, monitoring of uh, the environment as well. Now so does this it have the GPS in it so we can know where the bus is? It is. It does. Right. Yeah. Where the IP cameras so this is the 5504-5-G-W-I. Uh, the we made you sure don't have that have enough data. <laughs> <to survive. laughs> Not quite. I was thinking about calling it Frank or something easy. You know? This is but, what happens when you let engineers make products. Yeah, very true. <laughs> so one of the things that's been uh, brought to us is the concept of Internet of Things. And given that we were really adept at connecting things securely, uh, it seemed kind of natural that we start connecting more things. So we had people come to us. Um, we actually worked with some of the guys from Patchube, mm -hmm. yeah, the Internet sure. of Things for environmental monitoring down in Australia. Um, and so we found beyond remote infrastructure management, data center infrastructure management, that our attach rate is coming up with um, kind of new and interesting things, places that we didn't ever think we would ever have a product when we set out on this path years ago. Uh, floating fish farms. So we have product, one of the same ones that's on the desk here, in that case with a solar panel. And it's uh, hooked up to an RFID scanner that's reading salmon that are coming in and out of the floating fish farm. I was not, and it was not on the list of places we think it would be installed. What's the first the <laughs> What's that? The salmon are, are tagged with our ID? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can tell yeah. who's who. So you know when to go pick them or whatever they do. <laughs> uh, gaming machines. So yeah. we did a, uh, it was actually it was a press release we did. This is probably four, four years ago now. Yeah, it was it would be. one of our first million dollar POs was for the gaming industry where we sold these products into, uh, we built this SD4000, this is one of our smaller one port devices. It was adapted to fit into the gaming industry to keep uh, a software developer honest. So it was doing a, a local level monitoring of the transactions to be able to make sure that that matches up with the software on the other end. And we learned in this process, maybe you can tell more about it, about the physical detection. Uh, that was actually a different hardware product. Um, for this gaming product, we had to build custom hardware and one of the things they required was uh, uh, ferrous memory. So if, with tamper detection sensors, so if the case was opened, it would blow away any cryptographic keys that were stored on board. Uh, that was one product that we did there for them. Um, yeah, so we, we find that new markets and interesting things. Yeah. Solar panels, it's the same as smaller product here uh, for residential homes throughout Australia. Yep. Right, so, so yeah, we work with um, a, a company called Ingenero in Australia who do solar panels. Uh, and we talk to their inverters um, and push information back up to their in the cloud monitoring providers. Uh, this is the, the use case we talked about earlier, the, uh, the roadside cabinets. Um, you gotta provide high security on these things because the, the signs, you know, someone will get in there and be a merry prankster and put up zombies are coming or something. So this eliminates that need and uh, make sure that people can't do that. Uh, the buoys, we have, some, we have a bunch of product floating in the Atlantic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ultrasonic tracking buoys. <laughs> What's that? Is that how NOAA uses them? Is that? The national, the tsunami buoy? Is that what uses them? 
this, I'm not sure who the Tsunami boys are, but we, have, we deal with a company who does custom buoys that drop them into the Atlantic, and they do ultrasonic monitoring. And at that point, I, st I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. I'm not sure what that does, or the, the lookout for doesn't, boats. or. It doesn't sound like it's a market, like an ongoing you know, growth industry. Yeah. What's it, just a few buoys? Yeah, once you've tossed a few buoys, and it's not like you're going to get like a growing market of buoys. Well, I, I want to know who, who put the cell tower out there floating. <laughs> yeah, they're all close to shore, so you can tell the ships are coming in, I guess, or you can listen to whales. I'm not sure what they do with the ultrasonic portion, but uh, it's important to someone. Probably defense, you know? <laughs> Uh, and again, we have, we have a couple of different um, large projects in Europe right now with this product that's on the table for uh, bus connectivity, which is kind of different. I was going to say buses and bus stops, because you could actually talk to the serial port to program the display. The reader oh. boards, the LED reader boards? Oh, yeah. yeah. Whether the, you have a map which actually says the bus is coming in five minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, we've, so as part of the PowerPoint, this is finished. So we, we find ourselves in different situations with products in, in, in new and interesting places that are beyond just console management, which is our, our strength and our song, a strong suit and our, our core business. Um, but once we put cellular stuff on this, people started calling us. And we're working on one uh, recently where they're looking at doing in-ground uh, sensors for foot traffic detection. So there's a company who's built a vibration device that goes underground, and they want this not to stream back data, but just send text messages when something gets kicked off. So text they'll the spool up, what's that? Text the border patrol agent. Border Patrol, yeah. So anywhere where there's, they can bury these things in the sand, in the woods. They do it all around airports now. There was a big contract because there was a, there was like a drunken jet skier in Florida who got lost and walked up on the Miami tarmac. It was like, I lost was my a, jet ski. It was actually a JFK. Was it JFK? He, he swam, his jet ski broke down and he swam up to the tarmac and walked all the way through the yeah. airport before a Delta flight attendant saw that he was dripping wet and with a life jacket on and went, hey, yeah. is he supposed to be here? <laughs> so this company that, that called us is, uh, very interested in the airport business now and putting these vibration sensors and foot traffic sensors all around the airports. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure the TSA will be placing an order for those. And we'll spool the data and text message it out. So these devices are industrial rugged, wherever the spiky one went, and can survive it. Yeah, high temperatures. <laughs> we, we, do, um, we do see these in NEMA enclosures a lot. So we have a variety of mounting uh, techniques for vibration, uh, including railway and things like that. Yep. So. One of your slides said the extended temperature range available or whatever. What's the normal temperature range on these things? Let me go back and... 40 degrees. Yeah, I'll tell you in one second here. It's... Uh, yeah, negative 35 to 74, and then uh, negative 31 to uh, 165. So that's the extended, yeah. So that's yeah. the extended one. Uh, I suppose I could just look up the... Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry, I didn't have that on there. I thought there was both there. Tests and verified in the Sandys winters and summers. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, any questions about the solutions or products that we offer? What's the craziest use case you've seen? Like, example, stopping doors getting out. Like that. <laughs> I thought the floating fish farm was pretty odd. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was odd. The buoys, definitely odd. Um, like ones where you've sat there and gone, that was never designed for that. Yeah, the floating fish farm floating was the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> counting. You know, this is a device that we, we, we sell to, to Cisco engineers and stuff to manage high value equipment remotely quickly and gain instant access mm -hmm. to it to remediate problems with you know IT infrastructure. We never thought we'd be counting salmon yeah. and floating in a fish farm in Europe. So. That's probably one of the ones where I scratched my head the most and thought that's really the craziest spot I could that imagine. Serial attached RFID? Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's not a crazy, I mean, it's, you know, cellular backhaul and serial I.O. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Not altogether surprising that someone would find that. They did, we did have a land-based one where they have a, a trailer that comes out on the, on the cattle range somewhere in Oklahoma and they run cattle through and they had, a, we were just streaming back the IP RFID at that point. It was an IP-based RFID thing. So we were just a 3G router, but it was the same thing. They run the cattle through and they herd them through and count it. How about sort of Rube Goldberg and, uh, you know, scripting things and stuff people have done with that? In terms of well, capabilities? Yeah, Jeremy Stretches is a pretty good example yeah. of, of its flexibility. Um, Rube Goldian scripty things. Do you have any? I'm just trying to think of one. 
The door contact sensor, when you, when you spool the IP camera, take a picture of their face yeah, and text yeah. it and email it was one. That's probably the, yeah, the best one I've seen with the British motorway. It's caught For when we kind of adopted it in the physical the, security space. Yeah, with the web camera. So the, the webcam FTP and then was there a, yep. a script that detected a new file and wrapped it up in the web? Yep. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that's where that we, we, we started with. Man, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, extremely flexible platform. And, and as we've displayed here in the presentation, we started off with console management, mostly targeted at Linux servers and Sun servers. And as the market's grown and adapted, so have we. Um, and as soon as we put cellular on it, the, the crazy ideas have come up. And, um, but really, the, the uptime, uh, delivering business, business critical continuity, I think, is still the most key core component of a, a product solution set that we have now. It seems to me like um, the flexibility that you have here would create some support challenges for you guys. Do you all offer a support arrangement that you we, help people? We do with? offer support arrangements. Um, that nightmare is alleviated because most of the people that we find buying our products or attaching them to high value networking equipment. And those folks are certified in everything. And they like to get their hands on it and do what, the, what they want. And that's, we have not found the challenges that we expected we would have seen. So they're taking basically what's a somewhat of an open hardware platform and an open software platform yeah. and they're tweaking it around and they know more about it than anybody at that, that point. At the end of the day, yeah. And so some of the Rube Goldbergian things that you were talking about, uh, there's a carrier who has an application where they're taking um, 911 emergency call data and they're spooling this data up and at the end of the day they take it, uh, we, we do all the log file connectivity for it over the serial ports. We get all that data and they have a script that archives it into a certain format with a specific date format and ships it off within a 24 hour period to uh, National Archive for 911 stuff. And they built that in and developed it on the back end. They probably never even used a web interface of the product. You know, they got in, immediately went into config commands, built out what they wanted for their, their project, and moved on. So there's, we, we see people that both use the, the, the command line. Um, some use the web interface, but the, uh, the Cisco CCNAs and people like that just get in there and kind of make it their own. You know. So do you, do you struggle with situations sometimes where they have that one person that can do that? That one person leaves or something happens to that one person? You guys have to reverse engineer what that person did with the customer to make the product useful or expandable again? Um, have not seen that. No, we have a, a, no. a, a support report feature that dumps out in a very legible uh, format mm -hmm. what's been programmed into the device, what it looks like, what all the interfaces are. What uh, its current status is. And, so, and that makes it... That alleviates a lot of the problems with support. So, okay. so when that's, a request comes in, they just send across a support report, and then from that, it's usually enough to work out exactly what's going on. I can bring that up. Related to that, then, you know, if I had a hundred of these and wanted to put some more configurations on them, mm -hmm. what's that process look like? Um, at the press, at, at the moment, it would be uh, scripting. Um, you can put it on a USB key and push it out there. We're planning to move our CMS product down to becoming a large-scale mass provisioning product as well. Um, but it's not there yet. So we are planning to introduce template support and configuration management support on the CMS. Uh, but it's not there yet. But is, is there a text file? Oh, yes, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's an it's XML, XML file. file yeah. Yep. yeah, it's an yep. XML file. You can copy and paste it if you want and just change the addresses. It won't pull any of the keys, any yep. of the vital data. You can put it on a USB drive, save the config.xml, yep. which is just the XML only. Um, you could script it from config commands, which is probably the most that's what I've seen done. robust way of doing it is just scripting with config commands to a group. Yep. You, could, you could set it up like that. So we have seen users uh, come up with ways to, to centrally manage them over a course of time. So yeah, the XML config is here. You can copy and paste it. If you do the backup config, it'll go through and grab all the keys, all the other data that's... Uh, Any custom scripts? Yeah. All within there. Uh, but that, that is an area that we are we are growing into. It is on the engineering list. Yeah. Any other questions this time? Uh, I think you pretty much capped them all off with the floating fish one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
It has gone this far and it, it keeps going further and further. So as we, this M to M Internet of Things and how this is adopting Connect Everything, some of the, the data says there's 20 billion things are going to be connected you know, in the next 10 years. And the sensors underground, the sensors above ground, the sensors in the middle of the ground detecting air, yeah. terrorism, security, everything else seems to be getting connected. And that so. box actually brings in, like, as you say, the five volt open globe for external device connectivity, then Ethernet for whatever you want to do with that, and console ports. And Wi Fi. And then Wi Fi. And cellular. And you can go in into any for that. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition, you've got a, a basically a BSD operating system on there that you can bend to your will. Linux, yeah. Linux, yeah. Yep. Linux, okay, yep. Linux, sorry. Yep. Everything in Brisbane is BSD, I thought maybe you'd stuck with BSD, but anyway. No. Um, you've still got Linux systems you can bend to your will to, to hack on top of yep. to take it in any direction you want. So it's a console server at birth, but it's kind of grown up into this. Exactly. Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can be as creative as you like around that in terms mm. of what you want to get to do. Which, which is a challenge in marketing it. Because we don't want to lose, you know, our, our core uh, IT customers and focus on connecting oddities, you know. But it's something that we do see. Well, the good side is that the networking engineers are the ones that, you know, uh, you know, the guys come, the people come down to you and say, we need to connect this, you know, IP camera to this, you know, in the shed at the back of the building. How do we make that? The networking guys are going to lead you to that business potentially if they know the product can do those types of things. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's already there. I mean, like a lot of SCADA networks are being connected. A lot, a lot of different yeah. sensors are out there. And one question I had, there's a, a, you know, about, it's not so much the internet of things, but wireless connectivity things. So, I mean, the product there is taking you know, a cellular backhaul and providing, in this case, you know, either to 11 or whatever, or, uh, or, eight or, t or wire, uh, Wi Fi connectivity to aggregate things. Are you doing things with like Zigbee or other? Other kind of, uh, mesh we, we don't do Zigbee mesh wireless at this time. It's something that we've um, we've considered with product management, and they uh, they decided at this time, at this at this moment, it wasn't something that we were going to jump into. Yeah. And more more than just Zigbee, and there's kind of there's a lot of emerging protocols yeah. in that space. Yeah. Um, Not yet, but we'll see. You know, if if a customer demands it, then we'll probably adopt it. <laughs> but um, I think we'll, we'll wait till the customer demand generates it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know. well, I've got problems with SCADA systems being where the carriers are abandoning circuits in those areas. So SCADA systems in the middle of rural England, and yeah. they can no longer get DDS lines or X25 lines or you know the opposite. Very true. It's only it's either Ethernet yep. or 3G is really your only call. But the 3G, they want for an Ethernet circuit, they want to charge you know yeah. two billion bucks for a 10 meg for a DSL line. They want yep. you know, 100 pounds a month. So we're we're definitely a, a stopgap for having people have to rip and replace SCADA systems, where they need to upgrade or secure SCADA systems based on compliance. The, uh, our product can be the, you know, the, the effective communication gateway for that and be secure. Yeah. Above and beyond that, just the modem connectivity. But encrypting SCADA is like a whole big thing because they never have. Right. Um, yeah, I think your average SCADA system is only secured because it's inside a cabinet, which is inside a building, which is secure. Physically secured, yeah. Right. So that's their idea of security, and it's yep. not connected to anything. Mm. So we have had uh, customers in that market as well. That's something yeah. that we're seeing. So outside mm -hmm. of the traditional console stuff, we, we have seen a whole new market emerge. And um, we can also keep you updated on what other oddities we're connecting to. You know, we do microwave towers with diesel generators across Alaska. Um, the contacts can tell what the diesel fuel level is, and yeah. so they don't have to send a helicopter out there. And, um, we do dial line for that as well, landline stuff. and. A lot of fiber backhaul, fiber utilities as well. It's been really common, commonplace for our products. Mm. Let's see. Any other questions? Walk me through my conversation with AT&T next week. I'd like a data plan on this product. Here's the IMEI or ESN number. And they're going to say, well, OK, do you want the, uh, this, the I2 Gold plan, which has a static IP? And they'll say, it's going to be $50 a month. Say no, I don't want to spend fifty dollars a month. What's my other plan? And they'll say, Well, I'm in the consumer area. Um, all I know is I can give you this plan. So the goal is to find a way to contact the business side of the carriers. 
<laughs> you, you really have to get in touch with the business side of the carriers. The commercial side, when you walk into Verizon, you're like, hey, uh, activate this. <laughs> <laughs> the kids, the kids are like, buddy, I can't help you, you know? So, Yeah. You know, I've shown it to them on their website. Like, we're, hey, we're certified. It's on their website. You know, here's, here's, here it is. And they go, well, we don't do that. The business side does that. So you have to make sure that you get in with the business side um, to get any true plans pricing. And I have some contacts I could pass along. But th there is, like I said, the lowest cost that we've seen recently was an energy company that was doing between two and 300 sites at 60 cents. He goes, I got them down to 67 cents. Wow. That's pretty inexpensive for a private VLAN slice on an M2M -M data plan to provide the connectivity for just, it's... Companies have like a, already have a business plan with like a thousand mobiles on it. Probably. Yeah. With click to call yeah. and the, yeah, yeah there are, so... There are these plans where you can have... Huge, huge business for carriers, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's... That's going to get that. Yeah, I've worked, worked for institutions who have like 20,000 phones and you just rock up and say, yeah, and I need to add, an, I need another 500 SIMs for these, and you'll go, sure. Yeah. <laughs> 500 bucks, you get in there, son. Because he's already making 20,000 know, phones. So, so where it is now, who knows where it'll be in another three years, yeah. what the cost will be on how to connect things. You know? yeah. I was talking to, who was it that said they had 40, this is Steven, said he had 40 devices on his own yeah, home network. Devices on my home network. Yeah. And yeah. It, it could be 80 in five years from now, you know? It, yeah. So it, it, connecting oh, everything is definitely um, part of our strategy moving forward different yeah. connectivity, so part of the new products, the new strategy. I really wouldn't be surprised if it is. I mean, you know, Nest just came out with their 2.0, and they're really trying to do home networking with Wi-Fi and, you know, home control. And the same thing, I've seen some really cool um, remote uh, devices for business that do lights and power and temperature and all that stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if we have more Wi-Fi users that are uh, things than people in another couple. It's very true. And that and the uh, insurance liability goes down on vacation homes and rentals and places that don't have people living there all the time if you have water leak detection sensors and part of the smart home and the smart connectivity. And I think that works for businesses as well.